Today's episode is the second of a three-part series we are going to do looking at what life might be like on colonies or colonial spaceships. Today we are focusing on those ships, mostly on the interstellar kind, but also the ones we might use in our own solar system, and we will start with those to introduce some concepts about size and spaceships. We are not too interested in how they get from point A to point B though. We talked about that in the Spaceship Propulsion Compendium, and for the interstellar ships I will be assuming they have at least working fusion technology. Though as we have discussed before, we do have options for interstellar expansion that rely strictly on a mix of solar and fission technology. Now to ask ourselves what it is like to be on a colony ship, we have to know a lot of the particulars about the ship and its mission. So we are going to invent a bit of a fictional narrative to help us follow along today, and we will continue that on into Episode 3. We will make some assumptions about the crew, the mission, the ship, and the technology, but I will give quick asides about the alternatives as we go. I also want to add that I won't be tailoring my assumptions to what I consider most likely but what I feel best illustrates the concepts. So we will be looking at two scenarios and two ships. The first will be a colony ship to Saturn, which we will arbitrarily say is going to include 200 people and last two years, from when they leave to when they arrive. The second will be an interstellar colony ship to Tau Ceti, 12 light years from here, and it will house 200,000 people and arrive in 120 years. What it does when it arrives we will discuss in Episode 3. To make things simple to follow, I will name the first Hyperion because that is the name of their destination, Saturn's moon Hyperion. I will name the interstellar one Unity, for my favorite space colonization game, Alpha Centauri. That was the name of the ship that brought the folks there. Now we will also assume Hyperion is going to be one of the first fusion powered ships and that the technology is still very weak and iffy. It can run life support and an ion drive. Hyperion also has a mission, it is going to get to its moon of the same name and start mining and manufacturing a space elevator to be used on its neighbor, Titan, where a much bigger colony is planned. Hyperion is a pretty big ship, people will be on it for two years and it had to be constructed in space. It's about 200 meters from stem to stern and about 50 wide and high, it also masses out at around 100,000 tons on par with an aircraft carrier, though much of that is reaction mass for the ion drive. But everyone lives in the habitation module, which is a series of ten nested cylinders, each spaced a bit over head height apart, and all rotating six times a minute to simulate Earth normal gravity of 1G on the outermost bottom deck, and 90% less on the floor above. One handy aspect of nested layered rotating habitats is that if they are all spinning at the same rate, their gravity and floor space is proportional to their radius. So the cylinder half as wide as the outermost one will have half the gravity and half the floor area. We've got 10 so the gravity is all 10%, 20%, 30%, etc. The habitation module is about as long as it is wide, and only about a quarter of the ship. It has one more non-spinning layer outside it with a vacuum sleeve to keep friction down and you enter and exit it through the two necks on Deck 1, which is basically just a long corridor between those with ladders and stairs down. The rest of the ship, which is most of it, is pressurized but has no gravity and is on the cool side. It is all cargo, fuel, and a couple workshops where gravity isn't necessary or maybe unwelcome. The folks who go out there to grab supplies or work there wear sweaters and have space heaters in their workshops. The engineers who keep the engines and power plant from breaking work out here, so it is no surprise they tend to be a cranky lot. Anyway, someone on the ship has to be cranky, and I don't want that to be the doctor. I know ship's doctors are supposed to be cantankerous sorts who will smoke a cigarette while examining you, but always needs to be friendly, as we'll see in a bit. This is not the first colony ship. There are already tons of colonies closer into the sun, mostly running on solar power and providing all the metal for the huge industrial complexes orbiting Earth and other places. Most have been around long enough they'd like to expand, 
But to do that, they need to grow more food on site and they need nitrogen to do that. They need thousands of tons of it, and that's why Titan, with its dense nitrogen atmosphere, is now a desirable colony. With the space elevator in place there, it will be able to cheaply ship tons of nitrogen into the inner and middle solar system colonies. Hyperion is the one that will manufacture that elevator and get the docks and industries in place for rapid expansion on Titan. It wasn't easy to recruit for, it's not a prestigious job, and space isn't that prestigious anymore. A few million people already live and work in space, albeit mostly in low Earth orbit. So a two year trip to the edge of nowhere wasn't something that had lines stretching out of the recruitment center. This makes life a bit hard on the ship's captain, the ship's cook, and the ship's doctor. When they left they found out that the company contracted to hire on all the miners and manufacturing teams was getting a bit desperate and would take anyone with the right skills, many of whom don't have much past history. Or rather, they probably do have a lot of history, they are just trying to leave it all behind. So when our doctor goes to open his patient files and histories, he's horrified to find out that almost half of them consist of name, age, and blood type, and nothing else. This isn't a scientific voyage either, so he hasn't got any fancy DNA analyzers. We know what his life on the ship is going to be like for the next two years. Morning, coffee, appointments all day except for emergencies. Checkups, of course, even on the folks in seemingly great health and trying to pry information about patient and family histories out of taciturn crew members, many of whom get touchy, evasive, or even angry when you ask about their family medical history. Plus he's trying to deal with the ship's hypochondriac, who is convinced he has every illness known to man, including some fictional ones. And the ship's psychologist hasn't dealt with that yet because he's busy dealing with Dave, the ship's navigator, who is convinced the ship's computer is out to get him. On top of that, the ship's captain keeps pestering him to let her look at the files on the crew he has gathered because she has the exact same problem of wanting to know everyone's background but having scant personnel files to work with. And the last time he mentioned doctor-patient confidentiality covering those files, she gave him detailed instructions on where he could file any complaints about confidentiality. Now we've got the cook, who spends a lot of his time on the upper decks where the gravity is low because plants don't much care about gravity besides using it to orient themselves off of. Most of the upper decks are for hydroponics, and even Deck 1, which is mostly a wide corridor, has plants all over it. A few dozen of the crew walk on these levels, just growing food to supplement their supplies, and he's up there a lot with his assistants, grabbing plants for meals and arguing with the ship's botanist about what should be getting grown. For a trip shorter than a few years, you don't actually benefit from growing food, except to supplement your diet with some fresh produce and to help recycle your air and water. You can pack around a year's worth of food for one person into a cubic meter if you have to, and there's a cutoff point where all your equipment you need for growing food will mass more than the amount of food it will grow. But their colony is going to be expected to grow all its own food, so right now they have been converting every extra space into more gardens to further stretch out their original supplies and to get more people trained to do it. The manufacturing teams have been getting practice recycling the old food storage packaging into more hydroponics trays, and it's not all hydroponics anymore either. The ship didn't start off with any dirt and soil on board, but it seems to be acquiring it at a rate of about 100 kilograms a day, non-coincidentally about the dry weight of food consumed each day. They are also not vegetarians so they have chickens, fish, and some goats on board. No cows, too heavy and messy. But they've got goat's milk for some dairy and eggs from chickens, and the fish are intricately connected to their hydroponics. That's not their only animals either, so they have a veterinarian. At some point in the history of spaceflight, some lazy scientists let the lab rats escape and ever since there have been rats on ships and space stations. And that gave people an excuse to have cats, and that led to dogs because if cat lovers get their pets, you can't go leaving man's best friend behind. And ferrets too because they're more useful. Now all the people live down on the bottom deck where gravity is what it should be. It is not that cramped at all, that bottom deck has almost 8,000 square meters of floor space with only 200 of them. 
They could each get away with a fairly comfortable 10 square meter personal cabin and still have only used a quarter of that deck, the rest being common areas like gyms, the cafeteria, the bathrooms, and so on. We will find that the further ahead we go in space flight, the more living space ships tend to have. We've talked about this before, especially in the Arcologies and Impact of Fusion episodes, where we got a bit more specific about how much energy you need for each person when you have to make your own sunlight for plants, and what it converts into is that you basically are controlled in population by how much heat you can get rid of, which in space can only be done by radiation, which in turn is controlled by the outer surface area of your ship. This is not an issue for our ship Hyperion yet, but it will be a big one for Unity, our interstellar version, which we will get to soon. I have opted, semi-arbitrarily, to put the exterior surface area needed for each person, to get rid of all that heat associated to keeping them alive and happy, at 100 square meters. This would correspond to a power budget of about 40-50 to 50 kilowatts per person, though also has to include the energy loss to heat in the reactor while it produces the electricity they need, which itself will mostly be artificial, spectrum-tailored sunlight to grow plants. Again, those aforementioned episodes discuss the nuts and bolts of that. Hyperion's hull is close to 200,000 square meters, which would let you purge close to 100 megawatts of heat, about an order of magnitude more than the ship is producing to keep the crew happy, hence why the areas outside the habitation module are cold. They also could have gotten away with more people on the ship, maybe ten times as many. But let's talk technology real quick and distinguish a passenger ship from a colony ship. A colony ship needs to build its colony when it arrives, a passenger ship just needs to carry people. Now we often consider having robots arrive and build everything, or colonists who don't need much equipment because they can make it on site. Ships following the robots with people, or that don't need much gear, are not colony ships any more than a passenger plane carrying some migrants from New York to Omaha is. Even if that entire plane was chartered to carry folks who were planning to move and become farmers, it isn't a colony plane they aren't bringing their tractors with them. Hyperion is a colony ship, it is mostly cargo, it is going to flat out land in a crater on the moon Hyperion, and everyone is going to keep living in that habitat module for months or even years afterwards as they unpack and expand and get their colony going. So it is mostly cargo and they have plenty of space, their real limit on space was making sure they could keep everyone warm because even their hull and shielding material is cargo they are going to eventually cannibalize to build with, using local rock to replace most of the radiation shielding. If Hyperion was a passenger ship, they'd probably only need a few kilowatts for each person, because they'd only be growing some food to freshen up their diets and recycle air and water, though it still wouldn't be particularly cramped because building large in space is a lot easier and doesn't cost you as much, relatively speaking but colony ships will never be cramped because of the need for a lot of cargo space, which in space actually means cargo mass, and a lot of construction material can serve double duty as part of the ship's hull. I don't just mean in the sense that you could recycle it, though any spacefaring civilization needs to be very good at recycling, but in the sense the ship's hull is almost entirely about radiation shielding, not keeping space in and air out which a hull as thick as a soda can will do. Your crate of solar panels can be opened up and pinned against the hull instead of boxed up, to add shielding. Your tanks of water can be on the hull, to provide shielding. So can your fuel and so on. Alright, let's move on to the interstellar side of things. About a year ago we did an episode on interstellar colonization where we looked more at the mechanics of spaceflight, but I mentioned there are five categories of colony ship. We will be adding a sixth one today, which is what Unity will be, but let us review the original five. Those were, number one, Methuselah ships, ones that take a long time to arrive but the crew is nearly immortal so it is the same people arriving as left a century before. We assume someone has cracked away to extend life indefinitely or nearly so. Number two, Sleeper ships, where all or most of the crew are on ice for the duration of the voyage. Number 3, Generation Ships, 
where people live their normal lifespan and it is their children and grandchildren and great-great-grandchildren who colonize the new world. Number 4. Seed Ships These are heavily automated ships, typically with no human crews, that arrive with frozen DNA material and set about colonizing and terraforming a new planet with follow-up passenger ships ready to arrive at pre-made facilities, or even having humans grown in tanks and raised and educated by those machines. Number 5 was Data Ships, where we skip the organic part entirely, either because the people are digitized themselves, or maybe were artificial intelligences already, or the organic component was stored strictly digitally, we can print DNA after all. Now we detailed those more in the Interstellar Colonization episode, but I want to add a sixth category, Gardner Ships, which I basically made up last week, and also discuss the misconception about freezing people. Let's do that first. Cryogenics is an awesome technology because it lets us freeze people now and hopefully resurrect them down the road. We can't do that yet, and what a lot of people miss is that the technology you need to resurrect human popsicles is, automatically, the same one needed to extend their life indefinitely. We might figure out some way to extend lifespans without medical nanotechnology, but you need that to bring people back to life after freezing them. The simple ability to unfreeze humans implies a near certainty you can also repair all the damage associated to aging. So Category 2, Sleeper Ships, would not exist to ensure your crew didn't die of old age. That only leaves keeping them alive the whole time or keeping them out of the way as a hassle. But it is never an issue to keep people alive on an interstellar spaceship because the kinds of energies needed to get any ship up to interstellar speeds is just huge compared to the energy needed to provide life support even over a thousand year long journeys. Your power limitation on an interstellar ship is only about getting rid of the heat you produce, because the energy needed to run that ship is tiny compared to accelerating and decelerating, even if you are only going 1% of light speed and your voyage will be a thousand years long. If you are going 10% of light speed, you need a hundred times the energy to get to that speed and your life support needs are cut to a tenth, as the voyage only lasts a tenth as long. Proportionally, it now makes up a thousandth of the energy budget the 1% of light speed ship needed to keep people alive, which was already small compared to its acceleration and deceleration needs. We will be assuming for Unity, our example interstellar colony ship, that it is traveling at 10% of light speed, which is about the top speed fusion permits. Now fusion fuel is stupid cheap, it is the most abundant stuff in the universe, so you can bring as much cargo as you want at those speeds. Our two big alternative power sources for higher speeds, antimatter or black holes, are likely to be quite expensive as fuel sources, so even if you have them you probably opt for lower speeds for colony ships, half the speed, four times the cargo minimum for the same fuel. Passenger ships might go a lot faster, ditto seed or data ships. But a colony ship constructed to carry people and cargo in quantity will be better off taking its time and arriving with more equipment and manpower. So you only freeze people if they just want to skip the voyage, because if you have the tech to unfreeze them, they are also able to live indefinitely. If you don't, then you have to use generation ships anyway, because you lack the technology to extend life, unfreeze people, or to use seed or data ships. This kind of raises a problem, the whole point of a colony is to spread humanity out and increase our numbers, so your preferred colonist likes children and doesn't mind roughing it a bit, compared to the standard of living back home at least. They might consider roughing it to mean they have to walk a couple hours every day and their home only has 20 rooms in it. But the key thing is that your colony ship does not have a static population. You can force that. With the Immortal Methuselah ship you say no kids till we arrive and get the colony set up. For the Generation ship you tell people no more kids than are needed to replace those dying of old age and accidents. But the funny thing is, you don't really need to, and might be better off not doing it. You've got these ships that are going to be cruising through space for decades and are assumed to be equipped specifically to allow you to engage in a ton of in-situ construction. 
They are the result of decades if not centuries of practice back in our solar system of setting colonies up to manufacture almost everything they need on site and an interstellar colony has to be able to manufacture everything on site. Not right away, but they need to make everything except new technology there. Earth can keep beaming the colonists new scientific and technological breakthroughs, just a few years out of date from the light lag for data to arrive, but an interstellar colony has to make everything they need, including replacing all their machines for making things, and fixing anything the ship needs too. So first off, with a 120 year voyage to Tau Ceti, our ship Unity doesn't need its colonists fully trained when it leaves. It doesn't matter if the colonists are immortal or the grandchildren of the original colonists because they still have 120 years to train. Unity is not a ship carrying colonists and colonial equipment anymore, it is a place that manufactures colonists and colonizing equipment. If it is a generation ship, it constantly needs to birth and train new people with all the knowledge and skills needed, and they probably need to work to maintain their gear. So I am just going to assume Unity was a Methuselah ship where half the folks opted to be frozen and half did not, and before arriving they will have doubled their population, nice even thoughts. During the voyage they also got some tech updates from home that made colonizing and staying alive on that ship a bit easier, and that's why they decided they could have children. They probably also had extra sleeper pods to accommodate anyone who changed their mind partway there or as spares, and they could manufacture more if they needed to. Personally though, I can't imagine going on ice to relieve boredom. I don't think the ship would be boring, and even if it was, I have thousands of books and shows and films to get around to reading, and at least that many being beamed to us from home every year. I might even decide to make some on my own. I personally could keep making these videos and sending them home the whole trip. They'd be years old when they arrived, but they'd be new to the audience. And this isn't a ship of a few people or a few hundred, it is a ship of a few hundred thousand. We are transplanting humanity to a new star system. So let's scale up Hyperion, ten times wider, conveniently the ideal diameter of a rotating habitat as it allows full Earth gravity at only two rotations per minute, which does not appear to cause any problems at all for anyone. Now let's make it ten times longer too, otherwise identical. We now have a ship with a thousand times the volume but only a hundred times the surface area, so it can only purge one hundred times the heat, enough to let us support two hundred thousand people comfortably. Probably a good deal more. We will assume when we left we had two hundred thousand people and half went on ice and half remained awake. When we arrive we will have one hundred thousand sleepers, one hundred thousand more who lived through the entire flight, and another one hundred thousand who were born along the way. Now with the improvements made since we left, we figure we can easily squeeze in another 100,000 people if we had to do this all over again, supporting those 300,000 all awake if we wanted to, but we arrive with 300,000 this time. Many of those who spent the entire journey awake or who were born en route are no longer entirely happy with the idea of settling at Tau Ceti. The ship is now home. The ship can be repaired and refueled and it would have a whole century to the next star to turn raw materials into new colonial equipment. Heck, they could even expand the ship at Tau Ceti if they wanted to. They could settle the next system even better with all the new tech and improvements sent from Earth and from the first interstellar colonization effort at Alpha Centauri, which is already up and running and has been for decades now. The provisional governor of the colony checks with the people now that the frozen ones are awake and it turns out many do like the idea of staying on the ship to go colonize another system. It doesn't have to be a lot, they can breed up new people in the century to the next destination. So he tells them that Unity will remain to help set up the colonies for a few years and get refueled and get raw materials, then they can leave with anyone who still wants to go or has since decided to do so. Now it is essentially a new type of colony ship, which I will call a Gardner ship, because it can just keep working its way out to ever new solar systems, traveling for a few generations to replace their people and manufacture new colonial equipment and dropping a chunk off at each new system. Each time some elect to remain behind on the colony and others on the ship, rinse and repeat, all the way to the edge of the galaxy maybe. 
They could stop, forever, at any system they wanted to, or pause for a generation if they wanted to, or even divide the ship to make two, like an amoeba, to cover two new lines of colonization. And in many ways this isn't a ship to get to colonies, it is a colony all on its own. With a couple hundred thousand people it has its own farms and factories, and its own schools and universities to train colonists, but it has everything else too, its own shopping centers and restaurants and probably landmarks and monuments. As it plows through space to the next system, it will probably have a great big monument built on some deck to each colony it founded for instance. It will get its entertainment and science from back on Earth and colonies it founded, but it will make its own and develop its own customs and traditions. I have to admit, the Gardener ships, seeding ward after ward, appeal to me a lot. I would enjoy being crew on something like that. I mean if you are immortal, I can think of worse ways to spend your time than being an officer on some ship meandering out toward the edge of the galaxy, stopping every few decades for a couple years to seed a new colony. And if you got bored with it, you could always stay at the newest colony and give up your crew slot to some person born on the most recent leg of the eternal journey that thought crewing a ship would be more fun than being a colonist. I'm not sure how practical Gardner ships would be compared to one-shot ships constantly sent out from back at Earth or the nearest system that was populated enough to want to make their own, but they sound cool, and an interesting aspect of that would be that each new colony would have neighbors near them with a shared background and relatives, which might make interstellar relations easier. I can imagine getting on one and staying on it for thousands of years, maybe even going on ice from time to time and getting out to the edge of the galaxy and looking at the others and saying, why not, and just sailing off to another galaxy. It is a fun daydream, kind of what the purpose of this channel is for, we just try to give it a little formal solidity of science. Alright, so that's life on a colony ship. Next week we finish out with those passengers arriving at their new solar system of Tau Ceti. If you want alerts when that and other videos come out, make sure to subscribe to the channel. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure to hit the like button, share it with others, and try out some of the other episodes on the channel. Until next time, thanks for watching, and have a great day.